scripture for today is Judges 4, 9. You will receive no honor in this venture for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hand of a woman. Very interesting. That's what our topic is for today. Um, our Hebrew word study today, um, two words that I've chosen. One is kavod, which is in Hebrew, glory, honor, respect. And um, it comes from the root, which means heavy or rich, as in possessions. So that glory, there's just a weight to that glory. And we know when it's speaking of the glory of God, it, there's just that heaviness of, of his glory, you know, that, that comes upon us. Uh, the wor other word is gibor, which means um, hero, as in mighty, uh, possessing courage, self-sacrificing, moral excellence, and a warrior. But less of a warrior than the emphasis being on godly excellence, not so much on physical excellence. As we think of a hero as someone that takes charge and is strong, you know, this is morally strong in the Bible when, uh, when we speak of a hero. And this hero is able to do extraordinary things because of the glory of God that uh, is upon him. It's not his own uh, strength that is doing it, it's God's strength because of his faith. And I'm, I'm thinking now of Samson and how strong, the strongest man in the world, uh, yet that was removed by the Lord and he had no strength at all. So it was all God, all God. Now the other word we're going to look at is uh, one of the ladies we're looking at today whose name is Deborah and her name means bee. And uh, it's interesting that the rabbis say that uh, God's word is sweet like honey, but it can sting like a bee. <laughs> and we all know that, don't we? We all know when we, when we read scripture, sometimes it's just so wonderful, but then there are things that really can hurt us, you know. And uh, especially when we look at our own sin, you know, that's revealed to us. <clears throat> okay, we're going to do the Book of Mysteries today, and uh, we're going to look at day 247. I kind of wanted to do that because uh, people have a a little bit of a mystery about the Hebrew calendars. They have two calendars, one that starts in the spring and one that starts in the fall, and people get them all mixed up. Uh, the fall calendar is the, um, is the actual calendar that they use, and that's when they celebrate New Year's in the fall. Uh, but God, and that's the original calendar, as far as I can tell, that was the original calendar in Genesis. But at Passover, they were given a new calendar, a new system, and this is the religious, the godly calendar, and, and God's feasts are all on this calendar that begins in the spring. And it just makes sense because everything is renewed in the spring, and uh, we're being renewed by Christ uh, dying and, and, and uh, being resurrected. First fruits will be part of the first fruits then, and so it just all flows together and makes a lot of sense. And um, so we're going to look at the two calendars just a little bit today in uh, the Book of Mysteries. And he's going to give a, his viewpoint on this, of what God has uh, really revealed to him. It's 247. We were in the chamber of books, and the teacher placed a large book on the table and opened it, what looked to me like an old diagram spread out over two pages. It's the Hebrew calendar, he said, and it lies behind every event in scripture. This, he said, pointing to part of the calendar, is the month of Tishri, and this is the beginning of Tishri called Rosh Hashanah, which means the beginning of the year. Uh, Rosh in, in Hebrew means head, so it's head of the, head of the year. They uh, also use that for the month. They'll say Rosh Kadesh, head of the month, the first day of the month. Uh, so the year begins with the month of Tishri, and when is that? At the start of autumn. Now look over here, he said, pointing to the opposite page. This is the month of Nisan in the spring. Nisan also means the beginning. I have to correct myself. I'm going to stop right here. I think last week uh, I, I was talking about the first month of the um, religious calendar, which is this time period right now, and I called it Adar. 
Adar is the last month, and every seven years, I believe, they add one more month of Adar. So there's Adar 1 and Adar 2, and then it's Nisan. So I just want to correct myself about that. Nisan is the first. Nisan also means beginning, and so they're both identified as the beginning. Uh, the Hebrew year has two beginnings and two calendars. Well, how can that be? The year that begins in the autumn, Tishri is considered the civil or secular year. But the year that begins in the spring with Nisan is considered the sacred year. So the people of Israel lived by two calendars, and so do all the children of God. What does that mean? Every child of God has two calendars and two beginnings. The first calendar begins their conception. The second begins at the moment of their new birth. The first calendar is natural, but the second is supernatural. The second is sacred. When you're born again, you begin living in the second calendar, the calendar of the sacred. And when does the sacred calendar of Israel begin? In the springtime, the time of Passover. And so it is for all the children of God. The sacred calendar is always ushered in at the time of Passover. So it is with the death of Messiah, the Passover lamb that ushers in the springtime of your life, your new beginning, your second and sacred calendar. So how do we live with two calendars? Each day you will be given a choice to live in the old calendar or the new, in the old identity or the new, the old life or the new, the natural or the supernatural. So every day you must choose not to live in the old calendar or walk in the old life, but to live every moment in the new identity and life, in the supernatural, in his grace, in the calendar of the sacred. So the mission today is to live this day not by that old calendar and not according to the old course, but by the calendar in which every day and every moment is new. So that's really a, a neat perspective on it, isn't it? And may, it kind of helps us um, visualize the two calendars too for the Hebrews, you know, that we can understand better. Well, today we're going to take a little peek into um, the book of Judges. And, um, you know, the further I get into Judges, the more depressing it is. <laughs> and, and so uh, I really encourage you uh, to sit down and uh, read through it and just uh, get, a, get a view of the whole thing because it's a picture of what happens when you don't have a, a godly leader. And uh, that's basically their problem. Every man did which was good in his own sight. And uh, when you do that, why anything goes, you know, whatever makes you feel good, why well, you do it. I mean, you know. It sounds like I heard that yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think we can apply that to today really easily. So um, it has a lot in there for us. But uh, we're not going to cover the whole thing, uh, the whole book of Judges. So that's why I really suggest you get in there and read it. Um, some of it's kind of gruesome. Uh, we may talk a little bit about that, but we're focusing on the women in the Bible now. And so uh, we'll kind of jump over some of these things. But uh, I really think it's, it gives you that good background as to why things are happening and what's happening. So um, try to do that if you can. Um, the background of all of this is that jo uh, Joshua and the tribes finally crossed over the Jordan. We uh, kind of went into that last week and began to take the land. And uh, they were able to conquer 31 of these little nations, these uh, Canaanite nations, but they didn't get them all. But Joshua looked at it now that they had really accomplished most of it. And there were just, thank you, there were just pockets uh, of people left, you know, and so he decided <sighs> war is bad. I'm, I'm, I'm talking for myself, but you know, you get tired of war and it's time. Sometimes you say, well, you know, let's just kind of change course here a little bit. And I think that's what he did. He said, uh, everybody go back home. Uh, things have pretty much been taken care of all around, and you take care of your own little pockets of problems uh, in your own little territories. And he felt like they could manage it, and, which I'm sure they could have. But you know what happens when uh, people go home and they're tired of war and um, it's just easy to compromise. 
and I think that's what most of them did. They decided to live with the people around them. Uh, some of them had conquered enough, and they used them for slaves, and they figured, you know, that that was a good deal instead of getting rid of everybody, like God said. And uh, what eventually happens, you know, the kids uh, forget about the past or history, or maybe they haven't heard it, and uh, start wanting to marry the locals, and, and then the local girls bring their idols, and here we go. And so that's the pattern that we see now. And they, uh, we find that um, Joshua died at 110, and all of this time, you know, Moses was appointed by God, and then he had Joshua to take over and help them, and then by the time they've almost almost taken care of all the Canaanites, but not quite all of them, Joshua passes away, and now there's no leader. God hasn't appointed any one person. Uh, and so they're kind of, to me, they're like a bunch of sheep without a, a shepherd. And you know what happens to sheep without a shepherd? They're liable to end up anywhere. And that's kind of what they did. You know, they just kind of wandered around in their own little world and... and um, disaster and the further along you go in judges the most the more horrible it gets until they're just like the Canaanites in so many ways and uh, it's, it's really tragic but I see a pattern here and uh, in your notes I think you'll find it and it starts with God working miracles they believe they follow him and then what happens? Compromise. The next generation grows up not knowing the word of God. They start living in the world. They start idol worship. And now they're slaves to sin. And in many cases, they're slaves to other people. And then they start crying out to God. And then God sends a leader to them to, to save them. And... Then here we go, clear back up to number one again, it starts all over again, the same pattern, over and over and over. You can, you can read through Judges, and every few, chat, every few uh, verses it'll say, and they, they did evil in the sight of the Lord, and then God sent someone, and then they did evil in the sight. <laughs> he must be really tired of this, you know, all through history. It just, the pattern follows, and uh, I'm tired of reading about it, he must be really tired <laughs> of hearing about it. But yet he's so patient, so patient with us. And, and it's just like today, you know, we see so much evil in the world. And we Lord, why don't you do something? But you know, if he had done something before we were saved, we wouldn't be saved. He is waiting for people to be saved and allowing this to go on because he loves people so much. The people that are doing evil he loves, and and some of them will turn, you know, probably not very many, but some of them will turn, and he's waiting for them to turn. And so we have to be patient, too, because um, we, we are thankful for his patience in our own lives, and we have to be patient for other people, too, as hard as it is. <laughs> so let's open up to... Um, Judges 2 and 17, this comes uh, with the death of Joshua, and they no longer have a leader who's charismatic, who's godly, and um, so let me find it here. These pages. struggle with these pages so much. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, 2, 1 through 7. Then the angel of the Lord came to Gilgal, uh, to Bukim, and said, um, I led you up from Egypt and brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenants with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars, but you've not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I said also, 
I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your side, and their God shall be a snare unto you. So it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voices and wept. And who's the angel of the Lord? It's in capital, so that would be the pre yes, the preincarnate of Jesus. And then they called the name of that place Bukim, and they sacrificed there to the Lord. And when Joshua had dismissed the people, the children of Israel went each to his own inheritance to possess the land. So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen the great works of the Lord, which he had done in Israel. So as long as Joshua was alive and those who had seen the miracles, uh, things were going great and they, they followed the Lord. And so... Um, Now God sees that they're going to need judges throughout the wor world, or throughout the period, and um, when they cry out to the king uh, that they need a king, why then that will be the point where there won't be any judges needed any longer. Now this period lasted for between three and four hundred years, if you go all the way back to the uh, uh, pat for original Passover and crossing the Red Sea to the first king. So that encompasses that whole era, era of just uh, judges being the leaders. We, they were not so much judges as we think of them today. They were more um, generals to guide them uh, in any battles and things like that and to oversee that type of thing. But they were also God's um, vehicle for his word and so they would try to guide the people uh, godly in a godly what matter and God would speak to them and and then they would uh, would guide the people because the people needed that leader they just couldn't seem to do it on their own and they needed that leader and so uh, periodically uh, there there were about 13 judges in this time period over some of them once they got things cleaned up why they would rule for maybe 40 years 20 years one one time they had peace for 80 years and so uh, there were different time periods you know where things would be pretty good and they'd be peaceful with everything going on and then when that judge was gone why then the people went back and started all over again so that was it, this is the pattern that they had so uh, each time they'd cry out once they were oppressed and then God would send a judge to guide them. Now uh, we're going to skip here to the second judge that they had, the second period of time, um, just because I think it's interesting because he was a lefty and I'm a lefty <laughs> and it was unusual and he was able to um, defeat the king because he was left-handed. Um, at that time, people carried their knives, let's see, I guess it would be on their left side, so that they grab it with their right hand, okay. And so he was able to disguise his knife on the opposite side and nobody suspected it. And so that's how he was able to kill the king. But we'll, we'll read it so we can see. Um, this goes... Uh, Chapter 3, 1 through 31, I think it's very interesting. Now remember, this is going to be the second uh, judge, but he's not a judge yet. Right now, uh, as we read this, they are under deep oppression. The king is very evil, and uh, he's asked all the people to pay tribute. And so uh, the man here is Ehud, and he is in charge of this cavalry that takes the tribute to the king. And that's how he gets entrance into the king. And so he's bringing the uh, taxes or whatever you want to call them. Now these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. That is all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war. At least those who had not formally known it. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonites, the Hivites, who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from the Mount Baal, and of course Baal is God's uh, Hermon, uh, to the entrance of Hamath, and they were left that he might test Israel by them, 
to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he'd commanded their fathers in the hand of Moses. Thus the children of Israel dwelled among Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons and they served their gods. And I, I want to um, point out the Jebusites were right in the area of Jerusalem. That was where uh, David bought uh, that little plot of ground and it became Jerusalem. So the Jebusites were settled right in that. If you look on your map, I think... Um, it points out where Jerusalem, that would be where the Jebusites were settled, right in that area. Okay. Um, so the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they forgot the Lord their God, and served Baals and Ashraz. And therefore the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushim Rishathiam, king of Mesopotamia, and the children of Israel served uh, Cushan Rishathiam, eight years. When the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the children of Israel who delivered them, Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And remember Caleb, Caleb was um, kind of a partner with uh, Joshua, his helper. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel. And that was the first one. And he went out to war and the Lord delivered uh, Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim. Thank you, Lord, for making me pronounce that <laughs> so many times. So the land had rest for 40 years and Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. So as long as he was alive, that first um, um, judge, why they had peace. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord strengthened Eglon, king of Moab, against Israel, because they'd done evil in the sight of the Lord. And then he gathered himself the people of Ammon and Amalek, and went and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. So the children of Israel served Eglon, king of Moab, 18 years. But when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for them, Ehud, son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. By him the children of Israel sent tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made himself a dagger. It was double-edged and a cubit in length. So how big would that be? That would be 18 inches long. That was a big, big little dagger. Okay, I don't know how he could hide that, but he had it, had it underneath his well, rope. Yeah, probably, yeah, he had a robe down over it or something. Um, and it fastened under his clothes on his right thigh. So he brought the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when he had finished uh, presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back from the stone images that were at Gil Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. So he sent all, all the other guys away and, and he whispered into him. And of course the king thought, okay, he's got something good for me. And he said, Keep silence, and all who attended him went out from him. So the king sent everybody out so he could hear this secret. So Ehud came to him now, and he was sitting upstairs in his cool private chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he rose from his seat, and then Ehud reached with his left hand and took the dagger from his right thigh and thrust it into the belly. <laughs> and so he was able to do that because Ehud did not expect he would have, have the knife there. So... Okay. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he didn't couldn't draw the dagger uh, the dagger out of the belly, and his entrails came out. And um, well, you know, <laughs> you know what that is. <laughs> that dirt is a euphemism for um, yeah, you know what. <laughs> Okay, uh, yeah, you know, uh, King James cleans things up for us a little bit, you know, yeah, but, but God, but God, you know, he yeah. just puts it right out there, you know, <laughs> and so uh, that's what happened. But can you imagine that blade, 18 inches long, and it went in so far in him, even the handle was stuck inside him. So, I mean, that was... <laughs> <laughs> and
And when he had gone out, uh, oh, I didn't finish this. Um, then Ehud went through the porch and shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. And when he had gone out, Eglon's servants came to look, and to their surprise, the doors of the upper room were locked. So they said, he's probably attending to his needs in the cool chamber. Um, in other words, they thought he was going to the bathroom and probably <laughs> needed his privacy. Um, so they waited till he had not opened the doors still in the upper room, and therefore they took the key and opened them for their master. And, and uh, in Hebrew it said they were embarrassed about even coming in. They're probably a little bit nervous about coming in on him without uh, him calling them, because, you know, in those days you didn't want to go before the king without him calling. Um, and there was the master fallen dead on the floor. But Ehud had escaped while they delayed and passed beyond the stone images and escaped to Sarah. And it happened when he arrived that he blew the trumpet on the mountains of Ephraim and the children of Israel went down with him in the mountains and he led them and he said to them, follow me for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the, lo the fords of Jordan leading to Moab and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab, all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day and under the hand of Israel and the land had rest for 80 years. So they had peace when it said it, they had rest, that means they had peace for 80 years. Now after him, uh, was Shagmar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. That's all it has to say about him uh, at this point. So, What's an ox goad is a, a pointy thing, had a metal strip on the end, and they would use it to make the oxen do whatever they wanted. You know, if the oxen stopped walking or whatever, they'd goad them with that. So, um, it pretty hard to, you'd think it would be hard to kill that many men with something like that. <laughs> but God. God, but God, you know, uh, I, as far as I can tell, Shagmar, Shamgar was, um, I've been calling him Shagmar, Shamgar was um, not a Hebrew. Now, I don't know anything else about him, but uh, it's interesting. God can use whomever he chooses. Okay, so that's all it says about the third one. Now we're going to get into uh, the fourth judge, which is going to be Deborah, the only woman who is ever listed in the Bible as a judge. So that's uh, very interesting. Okay, we're going to read 1 through 5 in, verse, in chapter 4. When Ehud was dead, the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> so the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of the Canaan, and he reigned in Hazor. And as commander of his army, which was the uh, general, so to speak, was Sisera, who dwelt in uh, Harasheth Hagayim. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, for Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Um, they would be, it would be to the point where they wouldn't even use the roads. They'd be so afraid to use the regular roads, they'd have to sneak around to try to get where they were going, you know, to try to avoid any, anyone, you know, any of men or whatever. Um, just terrible things going on. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lipidoth, was judging Israel at that time, and she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came to her for judgment. So now we've met Deborah, and we find out she's um, a prophetess, and we find out that she's a wife, and uh, she's also a mother. We find that out later. And uh, she would sit under this palm tree of Deborah. Now, I used to think that that was probably named after her. However, if you go back to Genesis 35, and I think I wrote it down here, um, 35, 8. It's, uh, let's just go back and read it. Now remember, Jacob was married to Rachel, and 
when he left Laban, his um, father-in-law, and, and took all of his families, his families, <laughs> um, Rachel, uh, no, no, no. Uh, I got them mixed up, haven't I? It's Rebecca, Rebecca's nurse. When, when Isaac went to get his bride, pardon me, when Isaac went to get his bride, Rachel came and she brought her, her nurse with her, her nurse Deborah. Okay, and here uh, it's, it's speaking of Deborah the nurse, way back in Genesis. And it says, now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died, and she was buried below Bethel under the ter terebinth tree, and so the name of it was called Alon Baruch, means the tree of weeping. And so I truly believe that this Deborah, the judge, is sitting under the other Deborah's tree because it's the same area. So it just makes sense. Now, whether she was named after that Deborah, we don't know. It's just kind of interesting, though. But but that, there's that tie there that that seems to be the tree that they're talking about. So that's where she chose to um, to sit, and then people would come with their problems, um, and she'd give them advice. Sometimes she would judge, but she was a godly woman, and she was uh, a prophetess, and so God spoke to her in various ways, as far as we know, and... Um, she was admired by people, and she was um, honored by them, and uh, they, they recognized her as a godly, godly woman speaking for God. And um, so that's where we find her here. And um, then we'll go on to, um, uh, let me see here. Um, well, I want to cover up what, is, what actually is a prophet. Um, a lot of people kind of wonder about that. And um, there are two kinds of prophecy. There's foretelling and there's forthtelling. Foretelling would be telling something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, forthtelling is just prophesying to people. Uh, for example, when God sent uh, prophets like Isaiah, you know, and and uh, that such, and say no. Um, uh, Jonah, for example, I'll use Jonah because he sent him to tell the people that if they didn't quit sinning, uh, he was going to judge them. And so that is part of prophecy. That's forth telling because they're prophesying about God and they're presenting, you do this and God will bless you. You don't, you, you know, uh, God is going to uh, judge you for your sin. And so over and over, you know, the prophets would go to the various kings and, and warn them, and uh, some of them listened, most of them didn't. So um, that's basically the two things that a, that a prophet or prophetess does. Okay, um, 1 Corinthians 14.3, Paul says, Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So there, there we have the New Testament. Um, meaning of, of prophecy. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and read um, verses 6 through 8. As soon as I find it. Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Binoam, uh, from Kadesh in Naphtali. And she said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, Go and deploy troops to Mount Tabor? I'm going to stop right there. Uh, here, it, earlier it listed, she was sitting under the tree, and people were coming to her. And she was hearing these stories of all the oppression and all the things that were going on. And so the Lord just told her it was time to take action. And so she called Barak. And Barak means lightning. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, he didn't show lightning <laughs> when he was talking to her. But, um, but uh, he is represented as a hero uh, in Hebrews 11, in the Hall of Fame of Heroes. Uh, 
So uh, remember that. So she says, you know, the Lord is saying that you need to gather your troops together, 10,000 men, and go up to uh, Mount Tabor. And uh, from the sons of Naphtali and Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. So she's got it all mapped out. The Lord's told her what, what she needs to do and what Sisera needs to do. And uh, not Sisera, sorry. What um, uh, Barak needs to do. And, and God said he's going to present Sisera and all of his um, chariots right into their hands. Now, you have to remember at this time they've been oppressed. They have no weapons to speak of. <laughs> Him nothing and uh, just men and here's Sisera and he's got 900 iron chariots I mean that's like top of the line at that time you know and uh, Sisera put all of his faith in those chariots you know because who can defeat all those chariots you know <laughs> you have a lot of confidence when you've got all that and so that's what they were up against. And God was sending these men with nothing up against there. And of course, we know God can take any situation and flip it just, you know, for whatever his purposes are. But yet, for men, it's scary. It's scary. And so um, here Barak is told to do this. And Barak said to her, if you'll go with me, I'll go, but if you won't go with me, I won't go. Now, so many people point out, wow, what a coward this is. He's got to have a woman with him. Well, remember, Hebrews 11 says that he was a hero. And I see this as he had confidence in her, in her godliness, that God was speaking through her, and he felt confident if she was there, she could give him advice, she, could, she would be there, God would be with them, in other words. This, you know, the Holy Spirit wasn't with people like it, that he is today. And so, but she seemed to have that Holy Spirit with her. And so he wanted that with him. And so it's understandable that he would want her to tag along. So she'd give him moral support and she'd give, me, give him that godly advice that he needed. So I don't see him as being a coward. I see him as really wanting that Holy Spirit and that godly um, advice with him. So um, she said in verse 9, I'll surely go with you. Nevertheless, there'll be no glory for you in your journey you're taking, for the Lord will sell Caesarea into the hand of a woman. So she's saying, you know, uh, I'm going to go, but you're not going to get the glory. It's going to go to a woman. And, uh, you know, just reading this without reading any further, it sounds like she's going to get the glory, but that's not what she's talking about at all. She's not glory hungry. Um, and so Deborah, Deborah rose and she went with Barak to Gadesh. And Barak called Zebulun and Naphtali to Gadesh. And he went up with 10,000 men under his command. And Deborah went up with him. Now Heber, the Kenite of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had separated himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent near the terebinth tree at Zarim, which is beside Kadesh. So here's a little nugget that's just thrown in uh, out of the blue. All of a sudden, God's telling us about this man that had nothing to do with the situation at this point at all. He's not even an Israelite. He's a Kenite. But he's living right near there. And so we've got that in our minds now because we're going to need it a little bit later. So now we go on. And um, it says, They reported to Sisera that Bar Barak, the son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor. So now Sisera's got word. Well, they're coming. Okay. So he gathered together all these chariots, 900 chariots of iron, and all the people were with him from Heresheth, Hagaim, to the river Kishon. Now, I don't know what time of year this was, but uh, it uh, very possibly was uh, a rainy season. If not, God 
decided to give them some rain at this point. Maybe that maybe that was the surprise that it wasn't rainy season. I just don't know. But uh, they're at this point. Now, the river Kishon, um, in Hebrew, I, I don't know if it's exactly this part, but uh, somewhere in here it talks about um, the area, which uh, they called it a wadi in Hebrew. And a wadi is a dry riverbed. And so Sisera is being set up in this place. The Lord sent him there, and he's got this plan. And uh, you know what happens, especially in a desert area, you know, when there's a flash flood. And so that's, uh, that's what we're looking at here. Uh, then Deborah said to Barak, Up, for this is the day which the Lord has delivered Sisera into your hand. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down to Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord rooted Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. Now here it doesn't give us any details, but later in the uh, song of Deborah, why she goes into more detail about it. So he's all, what, what chariots aren't, just flooded away are stuck in the mire. And so he, Cicera realizes he's sunk here with, a, you know, he can't do it, anything now. And so he hops off to try to save his own hide. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> However, Cicera had fled away on foot to the tent of Yael. Um, remember, the J sound is not in Hebrew. It's, it's a Y sound. And she's the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. So now we know why God put that little verse in there. So he's on foot running away, and he's come to the tent of Heber. And he's not home, but his wife's there. Yael is home. Okay, now they had kind of a quasi uh, peace agreement, uh, Heber and uh, the king, to live in that area, you know. And uh, they weren't buddies or anything, but they kind of had permission, I think, probably to live there. So um, he thought it was a pretty safe place to be, um, to hide out. <laughs> and um, Yael went out to meet him, and she said to him, Turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me. Don't fear. And uh, so he, he went into her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. And then he said to her, please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened up a jug of milk, and she gave him a drink, and she covered him. And he said to her, stand at the door of the tent, and if a man comes and inquires of you uh, and says, is there a man here, you shall say no. So then Yael, Heber's wife, took a pen tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple and it went down into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary and when and then he died and in Hebrew why it goes into more detail <laughs> he was, it was not very pretty okay um, and then, as Barak pursued Sisera, Yael came out to meet him, and she said, Come, I'll show you the man whom you seek. And he went to, into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead at the peg, with a peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, and the presence of the children in the presence of the children of Israel, and the hand of the children of Israel grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. So why did she do that when she wasn't an Israelite? Well, possibly because he was on the run, and she knew if he was on the run, somebody was after him. And you don't want to be on the wrong side, if you're a woman especially, because they do terrible things to the women, you know, if you're caught um, on the wrong side of the of the war. And so it could be she was doing that to protect herself. The, he, the rabbis have a story, and true or not, we don't know, but their story is that she had a daughter who was raped mercilessly, is that a word? Merciful? Merciless? <laughs> anyway, it was really bad. 
uh, by his men. She was gang raped by him. So that's their, that's what they say. And so she was getting revenge with him, which is, you know, sounds possible. All right. Any event, um, a woman started this battle and another woman ended it. And um, very unusual, but God can use uh, things that we perceive as weak in this world uh, to shame those who are stronger. Because the men could have done all of this. But he chose to use a woman because the men were not willing to, to step up at the time. And sometimes that's the case. Sometimes women have to step up. And, and, and show the man what to do. Uh, it's not the ideal thing, but sometimes it's necessary. And so and we see that here. And so both of those women were strong women. Uh, I don't think I could have done that. <laughs> I can't imagine doing anything like that. Yeah, yeah, how, how you could do that. But um, God gives us the strength and the ability to do things we think we can't do. So uh, maybe they didn't think they could do it at one time, too. <laughs> so uh, interesting women. Um, let's see if I've missed anything here that's pertinent. Um, I want us now to uh, read the Song of Deborah. I think there's some things that need to be pointed out in it. And uh, the reason for these songs, you know, there's a song of Moses, there's a song of uh, Miriam, um, song of Deborah, and uh, God puts these in for people to memorize and to teach their children so that other generations down will know the stories. Uh, that was the important thing, you know, you, you teach your children from morning till night. And th this is part of the things. And, uh, you know, Hebrew boys, at the time uh, uh, that Jesus was on earth here as, as a, you know, before his resurrection, um, the Hebrew boys went to school. All the Hebrew boys would go to school. They all knew how to read and write. By the time they reached about 12, uh, they were um, kind of looked at, you know, by the teacher, by the rabbi. And those that showed promise would continue their schooling. The rest of them would follow their fathers in their trade. And so then there'd be another period of about three years that these kids, these boys would go. And um, if they showed promise, becoming a rabbi or teacher, why then they would continue on. And so the other ones would drop out. So they would just leave a few. And then they would follow a certain, at that point, they would follow a rabbi, follow him around, just like the disciples followed Jesus. That was the pattern of the day. There were other rabbis who had followings like that too, because that's the way they did it. That was how they learned. And then by the time they were 30, they would start their own ministry if they reached that point. So... Um, it wasn't like Jesus had done something completely different from anyone had ever done before. A lot of people think that, you know, but it's no, that was the pattern of the time. <clears throat> he had a certain special uh, program for him. There's no doubt about that. I'm not saying that that wasn't special, but it was uh, the way they did things. So uh, when people wonder whether the disciples could read or write, you know, or, you know, do things. Why they were definitely, they, they memorized the Old Testament when they were young. Um, so anyway, they, they knew their scripture. <laughs> my phone has a, my, is that what it is? It's never done that before. That's something new for me. Okay, let's get into the Song of Deborah. Uh, then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, and they're celebrating um, their victory. When the leaders lead in Israel, when people willingly offer themselves, bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. 
Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens poured and the clouds also poured water. The mountains gushed before the Lord, the Sinai before the Lord God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, and remember he was the third um, judge, um, the highways were deserted and the travelers walked along the byways. The village life ceased. It ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, arose a mother in Israel. Now, this is talking about the highways being deserted when I told you that they were afraid to be on the highways and all. Uh, they, everyone was just frightened. They were afraid to do anything. <clears throat> um, I arose as m I was a mother in Israel. They chose new gods, then there was war in the gates. And of course, remember the gates are where they make all of the city decisions and everything that's kind of like going to the courthouse. <laughs> Not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. They had no weapons. My heart is with the rulers of Israel who offered themselves willingly with the people. Bless the Lord. Speak you who ride on white donkeys, who sit in judges attire, who walk along the road, Far from the noise of the arches among the watering places, there they shall recount the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous acts for his villages in, I in Israel, for the people of the Lord shall go down to the gates. So she's talking here about all of the elites that were living. They weren't taking care of the people or they were just looking out after themselves. They weren't uh, standing up for what was right. Uh, riding on the white donkeys, that was some something that somebody that, had honor or prestige would do, you know, had some money or whatever. So that was, you know, what that represented. Awake, awake, Deborah, wake, awake, sing a song, arise, Barak, and lead your captives away, O son of Benoam. Then the survivors came down, the people against the nobles. The Lord came down for me against the mighty. From Ephraim were the uh, those whose roots were in Amalek. After you, Benjamin, with your peoples, from Machir, rulers came down, and from Zebulun, those who bear the recruiter's staff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah, as Issachar was with Barak, sent into the valley under his command. Among the divisions of Reuben, there was great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the piping for the rocks? The divisions of Reuben have great searchings of heart. Gilead delayed beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain on ships? Asher rem continued at the seashore and stayed by his inlets. Zebulun is a people who jeopardize their lives to the point of death, and Naphtali also on the heights of the battleground. So she's chastising those leaders of different territories who did not come and help. Uh, some of them did, as, um, as she's saying here. Zebulun, uh, they were willing to to uh, give their lives, and uh, Naphtali, you know, but some of these others, Asher and, and Dan, uh, some of those just stayed home and, and um, let somebody else do the fighting. They didn't come to the aid of their brothers, in other words, uh, <clears throat> because this was kind of a loose-knit um, country, with each one kind of controlling his own area rather than solidifying with the leader as when they get a king, you know. So uh, that's kind of the way things were going, but they should have helped each other. And uh, the kings came and fought, and the kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. Um, this whole thing happened in the north of where she was. She was uh, at Ramah, which is near, uh, let's see if I can find my, I don't know if they have it on here or not. Um, I do believe it's near around, um, kind of near where Jerusalem is, kind of in that area. But this fighting went on uh, up higher um, near the Sea of Galilee, and um, Megiddo is up in that area. Um, it's kind of north of, of uh, where Nazareth is now. Nazareth was not a nation at that time. I'm not a nation, but a city at that time. It might have been some type of a city, but it wasn't uh, under that name. And so all this took place near where Jesus grew up, really not too far from it. 
Uh, they took no spoil of silver. They fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses fought against Sisera. The torrent of Kishon swept them away. That ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon. Oh, my soul, march on in strength. Then the horse's hoofs pounded, the galloping, galloping of his steeds. Curse morose, said the angel of the Lord. Curse its inhabitants bitterly, because they didn't come to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. No one is sure what place morose is. It seems to be a town or something, you know, and God is saying, you know, they did not come to help. Uh, most blessed among wisdom women is Yael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. Blessed is she among women in tents. He asked for water, she gave milk. She brought out cream in a lordly bowl. She stretched her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's hammer. The word hammer is um, maca. Oh, I should look at that. I think I wrote it down. Uh, how to pronounce that word. Uh, Mahabath. Mahabath is hammer. And um, if you remember the story of the Maccabees, um, he, in fact, one of the Maccabees is called the hammer. The word Maccabee actually comes from hammer. That's, that was his nickname. They were, they had another name, but they, it became, they came, became known as the hammers, the hammer. And so that's where they get the word from that. <clears throat> now she was, she was probably uh, the one that put up the tent. She she could handle that hammer. <laughs> she knew exactly how, how to do it. Okay, uh, her right hand to the workman's hammer, and she pounded Sisera. She pierced his head. She split and struck through his temple. At her feet he sank, and he fell. He lies still. Um, at her feet she, he sank. He fell. And where he sank, there he fell dead. Okay, you got that? He's dead. And the mother of Sisera looked through the window. Now here, uh, they're looking out back at home at Sisera's place, you know, where his castle or whatever he lived in, his home, and uh, talking about his mother. And she looked through the window and cried out through the lattice, um, which is kind of the form of their window. Uh, why is this chariot so long in coming? Why tarries the clatter of his chariots? And her wisest ladies answered, and yes, she answered herself, are they not finding the, and dividing the spoil to every man a girl or two? For Sisera, plunder of dyed garments, plunder of garments embroidered and dyed, two pieces of dyed embroidery for the neck of the looter. So here her maids are giving her encouragement. Oh, they're just delaying, you know, they're raping a few girls and <laughs> and taking taking whatever goods they can find and they're going to be bringing all these things back to you you know you just wait um, thus let all your enemies perish O lord and let those who love him be like the sun when it comes out in full strength so the land had rest for 40 years after deborah so Okay, so. I suppose that is why they shut everything down in Israel one day a year. There's no, there's no commerce, there's no cars on the road, mm -hmm. there's nothing. That's a day of Ab. Do you think that's the song of Deborah? It kind of reminded me of it when, when it's talking up in the, in the earlier verses about the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. I don't know. Just uh, yeah, I don't know. I, the reason that is in the Song of Deborah is because they were afraid to be on the highways. Oh, I see. <clears throat> okay. They were hiding. Okay. They'd take other routes to get wherever they wanted oh, to okay. try to avoid getting um, meeting up with anyone like that. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. But um, just, yeah. Just what I, what yeah, I thought of. yeah, I, I know I that. I don't remember what that day was called. Yeah, so the day the, of Ob. Yeah, and Ob is. <sighs> yeah. Um, you know, more things have happened, more bad things on the ninth of Ob to Israel. That was the temple's been burned. Two temples have been burned, and just uh, there's such a list of things that have happened. You know, it's it's their day of mourning, really. Okay, so 
Okay, anybody have any comments or anything? <coughs> Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that's just because she was very hospitable to him. You know, when. When you go back and read what she said, down here, he asked for water and she gave him milk on 2.5, 5.5. And then she brought forth butter in a dish and she had the. Her hand had the butter in it, put the thing through it so it slid easily into his head. There it is. <laughs> um. so well, I was, never. It was in the quiet <coughs> of a bit of info. Huh. Well, I never. Song. Yeah, mine doesn't indicate that uh, different versions indicate different things but that's kind of an interesting you know made it slip in easier huh i don't know <laughs> she, put the, she brought forth butter in a dish she put her hand on the nail it just sounds like she could have used that to it had something to do with why she gave him milk not water okay um why would she give him milk not water um Mine says cream, so I didn't get that. Mine's well, mine says a butter. Mine <laughs> says cream too. Yeah. And she put her hand to the nail. Maybe I don't know. It's possible, I guess. Cream or butter or milk, I mean, tastes better than water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but she's. I, you're thinking she used it like a uh, to make it slip, go in easier or something. Is that what you mean? Oh. Maybe. I mean, why would they even mention it if it wasn't I don't know. Why did they use milk and not water? Because he literally asked for water. Well, partially because she covered him up. She was being a good hostess. She was making him feel reassured that she was going to protect him. And so, so he was able to relax and go to sleep, and then she was able to do her thing. If she'd been nervous and, and just not been very nice to him, why he would have been nervous about her. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I don't know about the cream thing. I guess anything's possible. Or the uh, butter, because mine says cream, so yeah. it's just a different yeah, interpretation. Yeah, it's just, it's just it kind of goes different. right there. It's kind of hard to tell, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, because they made quite a big deal I don't, about Yeah, it. I don't know why it says he asked for water, she gave milk, she brought out cream in a lordly bowl. Um, I don't know why they used one word and then not the other. Something to kind of look look at and see if we can find out any more information. But I, I don't know if <coughs> this is a comment or a question, but right off the get-go when you started um, and the angel of the Lord and you stopped and said, does anyone know what the angel, who the angel of the Lord is? And you said that's the incarnate. Pre-incarnate. Pre-incarnate, Jesus. Mm -hmm. So the angel of the Lord is Jehovah, God the Son. Is that the same thing? The angel of the Lord, capital L, is God the Son, the Redeemer, in the Old Testament. So I don't understand the, you said pre-incarnate. Well, that's I'm what, that is really what all commentators call him, so that's just what I did. So. He wasn't revealed yet. And then yeah, revealed yeah, here. yeah. So, why... If it's if it's the same person in the same um, appearance, if you understand what I mean by appearance, why do they use a different word? You know, that's my question. I don't know. 
So you're answering my question or comment with another question. Yeah. <laughs> because I don't know. Okay. Oh, good, good. Well, so I just, I just know that the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament is Jehovah. And since this is Hebrew Bible study, it, they are, it is, it is Jehovah, the Son of God. But I didn't understand the pre-incarnate. So it's just another way of saying Jehovah. I don't know. They've used, God uses angel of the Lord many separately times. many times in there when, he's, when he is speaking to uh, individuals. Maybe it's because he's presenting himself in a certain way. Whether they could see him, I don't know. We d we're not told that. Don't know whether he's visible. I know with Abraham, angel of the Lord, I think was visible. So... Sure. I, you know, so many mysteries we don't understand. Okay. <clears throat> just, that's what this Bible yeah. is all about, is yeah. asking questions. Yeah. Okay. Just good questions. I just mm -hmm. wish I knew all the uh, answers. Hey, well, it's okay. <clears throat> it's all right. Are we going to get to read about the hero today? The hero. Yes, about the word hero. Gabar. Gabor. Oh, yes, yes. Yes, I forgot all about that. You know, I'm not used to bringing this and using it too much. But, you know, I'm excited about it. This, you know, it's a wonderful book and I I would suggest if you get it, uh, start at the beginning yes, and because right. that's really the way it works. Is get sure. that found and don't just do it once. Yeah, I need to go back and back and back because I think it's so important to learn uh, Adam and all of the variations uh, that come from that word, you know, and, and how, how they all work together. And it's a picture that we can understand creation and how, you know, it's, everything is in the blood. You know, that's the most important thing. This is uh, God's secrets only Hebrew can reveal. Have to order it. it um, I would, I would go, on, if you wanted to get one, I'd go on Amazon, probably the cheapest place to get it. Mine and is It can be, I found them cheaper, but it, it just varies. And sometimes you can find one that's um, used. Sometimes people get them and they won't want them, you know, and Amazon, if you check, sometimes Amazon will have them cheaper. But um, I, it, you know, if you're really interested in Hebrew and you really want to learn a little bit, it's, you don't have to get into it deep, you know, you don't have to be able to speak it, no. but just to understand the, the words and what they really mean is just such an opening to uh, just learning. Just the first couple pages captured, captured my attention. Yeah, I mean. I particularly when I got to the fact that they could, the word please out of the Lord's mouth in the translation into our It's um uh, I just um I th this this fellow is a very interesting man. He's Hebrew he is a Hebrew uh man, but he's lived in uh, the United States for a long time. He was a uh, professor at uh, the University of Arizona for quite a long time. <clears throat> Yeah, and I like the fact that right off the get-go, he says, don't take my word for it. I'm showing you this, this, and this. And yeah. This. <clears throat> and there's a, there's a little uh, CD player or whatever. Not CD. What is audio? it? Audio? Yeah. It's an audio. Yeah. Um, MP3, I guess. Maybe that's what it is. Um, but it gives you pronunciation. Oh, you know, I couldn't get that to play my regular CD. I can get it to play my uh, what she said is yeah yeah see it's changed since I bought mine I only got one oh. the new one's got two yeah. two in there so I don't know about the other ones but um, just fascinating. The very last page talks about light, and, and the Hebrew word is or, or for light. You know, we've talked about that. It's just uh, just amazing things um, in here. I think you'll really enjoy uh, going through it, and uh, it's easy to read. 
but just full of information. So uh, we were going to do uh, hero. Hero. Um, 108. Is it 108? Okay. Um, I don't know. I 105. Oh, hero is 181. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, the word Gabor is missed by every English translation, translation in the Bible. Uh, each of the 40 Gabor mentioned in the Old Testament and each of the five in the New Testament occurrences is substituted with the word mighty, but mighty relates only to strength and size and misses the full meaning of Gabor or hero. Gabor is derived from the word, the verb Gavar, which means to win, to prevail. It's the same root uh, GBR as the word man. So the dictionary definitions of mighty uh, and many others say possessing great and impressive power or strength, especially on account of size, mighty men. Um, and that's, it was used for the giants in Genesis. Uh, that was one of the words, Gabor. Um, um, and it's uh, courage, self-sacrifice, being a warrior, and moral excellence. Being mighty is the least attribute of the hero. Take the example of David and Goliath. David wasn't mighty. Goliath was, but all agree that David was the hero. Why did English Bible translators avoid the word hero at the cost of distorting the full meaning of so many Bible verses? The first thing is to check the availability of the word hero at the time of the translation. An etymological animo uh, Research reveals that hero was first coined in English in 1387, where King James' version of the Bible was completed in 1611. Hence, the translators had 224 years to learn and internalize the word hero, and yet they avoided it completely. Was there something else that made the word hero unappealing to them? Was it again an issue of political correctness due to the Greek origin of the word? How, whatever it was, the cost was the inability of the English readers to get the true meaning of one of the most important words in the Bible. It's sad to say this, but exchanging hero for just mighty reduces the Im Im immensity of God himself. Who is the king of glory? The Lord is strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Psalm 24, 8. God isn't just mighty, he represents moral supremacy over his enemies. The Hebrew text here calls God a hero. Many may be mighty, but only those who demonstrate courage, self-sacrifice, being a warrior, warrior, and moral excellence are true heroes. So, um, I had something I was going to say, and it went right out of my mind. Um, I'm out of my mind. <laughs> um, shoot. Oh, well, it'll come later. One of God's names used by the sages to emphasize the truthfulness of God's word is ha Givara. The dictionary's definition of the noun Givara is courage, bravery, fortitude, grit, strength, and might. Note even here, where Givara is just a general term, might comes last in importance. And the use of ha Givara, ha is just the in Hebrew, ha Givara. Uh, is one of God's names uh, from ex the expression. I'm just not going to continue reading that. Um, uh, and then it goes on. Uh, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, the government is upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 5. Here too the Hebrew says, Hero, not mighty. This is a deeper depiction of the most important attribute of God. Not just a scary size God, but a hero. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who saves. He will rejoice over you with joy. He will be silent in his love, and he will joy over you with the singing. That's uh, Zephaniah 3.17. God loved David. Uh, beloved, his beloved David was also mighty, but a hero as well. 
um, one English verse properly defines mighty concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. Luke 24, 19. Although the Hebrew text here says hero, mighty in deed and word extends the character of the Lord from just mighty to the Lord of a hero. Okay, that was a lot there, but you get it. You get that, okay? So... Well, if there's nothing else, we'll uh, close in prayer. And next week, we're going to look at uh, the last few ladies in uh, Judges, and um, they're deteriorating in character. So, <laughs> All right. Uh, Father God, uh, we thank you, Lord, for this day, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for people who will share their knowledge with us that, uh, you know, such as Dr. Ben Gigi, so that we can understand the, the true Hebrew and the true meanings. Uh, we all have our own um, prejudices all through history, and those who translate had their own little prejudices, and, and that enters into uh, what they translate as hard as they try not to. And we, we kind of understand that, Lord. So. Um, we appreciate being able to go back to the true source and, and know the meaning there and get the full meaning. And we thank you, Lord, uh, for this day and, and for the week to come and all of your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen.